Hi, my name's Doug Belshaw, and I've been asked to talk to you today about digital literacies. I'm very sorry that I can't make it in person to the Netherlands today. Prior travel commitments made that impossible. But I hope that this pre-recorded presentation gives you some food for thought and helps set the scene for the day. I'm going to talk about digital literacies, about power and about libraries. And if you've got any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. So do pay attention to the contact details at the start at the end of this presentation. So without further ado, here we go, and thank you in advance for your attention. All right, so the first thing to say is that this presentation is available under a Creative Commons license. I'm sure most people here will have seen Creative Commons licenses before, but if you haven't, please do check them out. They're incredibly relevant to what it is that you're doing. This particular presentation, I've decided to release under a Creative Commons Zero license, which means it's public domain, meaning you can do whatever you want with it. You don't have to attribute it to me or anything like that. And I found that the, 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 the less restrictions you put on something, the more it goes out there and people use it because people know that they can use it however they want. And actually, most people will attribute you. As I've done at the bottom right-hand corner of this particular slide, this photograph of Amsterdam was taken by a guy called Cedric Klei, and I have referenced him even though I don't need to under the terms of that license. So who am I? Well, my name is Doug Belshaw, like I said before, and I wrote my doctoral thesis on digital literacies. You can find me on Twitter as DAJ Belshaw, but I spend more of my time these days on a decentralized federated social network called Mastodon. And the particular one that I'm on is social.coop. My background, I was a teacher, senior leader. I worked for JISC, who some of you may know in further and higher education. I worked for Mozilla for three years on their Open Badges team and as their web literacy lead. And then for the last couple of years, I've been a consultant. And I also founded a co-op with some people I worked with at Mozilla and some friends. Now, my doctoral thesis is available online, but I wrote it up as a much more accessible ebook that you can download and you can pay whatever you want for it, including nothing. You can access that by going to Digital Literacies and putting a dot before the ES. And I do encourage you to have a look at that because it goes into a bit more detail than I can go into in this presentation. The first thing I want to talk about in this presentation is about power. That's part one. When we're talking about digital literacies, we're always talking about power. This is possibly one of my favorite tweets of all time. What are people really saying when they say something is a literacy? This is Ed Tech Hulk, always tweets in capitals um, and is also quite humorous. So this particular tweet, if you can't read it, says, Hulk think you can put literacy after anything and make people take it more serious. Digital literacy, mobile literacy, Hulk literacy. So I find that hilarious. But basically what they're trying to, what head EdTech Hulk is trying to say is that people use literacy as something to say this thing is important to me and should be important to you and to everybody else too. So digital literacy at the end of the day is about power. People saying that this is something that we should pay attention to. And just like every other form of literacy, digital literacy is about power too. Now then, I see a lot of digital literacy frameworks. Um, these come out regularly from all different kinds of organizations. And I see different people and organizations adopt these digital literacy frameworks. And earlier this year, this is one that came out from the DQ Institute. Now DQ stands for Digital Quotient, it doesn't really matter what it is. But the question I've got is, is this any good? Is this framework any good? It's certainly colorful. It's a rhetorical question for the moment. You can decide amongst yourselves. It's certainly not great from a uh, accessibility point of view. You can see that white on yellow is not the best way of, of representing text on a background. But anyway, how do we decide whether this is any good? Let me give you some tools to be able to decide. So there's this great myriad of frameworks, and most of them look really visually appealing. A bit like when you go to a new city, um, including Amsterdam or London or Prague or wherever you go, and there's always people selling artwork. And you're never really sure which one to pick because they all look fantastic and they all look you know, like something you'd like to take home and put on your wall. So which one do you choose? Well, we shouldn't take each framework, each digital literacy framework at face value. Uh, if it was a painting, we need to know more about it. Like what, what's the context of this? What's going on? Um, what was the artist thinking and what was behind it? So just like paintings, 
digital literacy frameworks have some kind of context and background. And most of these frameworks, most of these digital literacy frameworks, have a rigid order to them. They are inflexible and they have a grid or something like that which says that these are the things you need to pay attention to and, and this, is, this is reality in some way. But it can be difficult to apply these frameworks unless you get your hands dirty and really dig underneath them and understand what the people who were putting together that framework were trying to do. It's a bit like going into the artist's studio and seeing what brushes they used, what paint they used, what context they were working in, what they were trying to do, etc. So we need to look behind the scenes of how these digital literacy frameworks came into being. Now, I spend a lot of my time on the web, so I imagine this as being a bit like view source on web pages. So I'm sure everyone here has done this before, but if you right click on a web page on any kind of modern browser, um, then if you right click, then you can go to view source, view page source. And if you do that, then you'll see something like this, which is for those of you who know some HTML, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, you'll know what this means and what the different elements are, and it's helpfully color-coded. And for those of you who don't use it, uh, or don't know what this means, then it's less important that you know what this is. It's more important than that you can do that. You can view the source of it. You know what it's created from. And the problem I've got with digital literacy frameworks is that most of them don't allow you to see how they were made. It's kind of a completely opaque process. So every organization's context is different. When you try and apply a digital literacy framework into your particular context, it's going to be different for you in the Netherlands than it is for me in the UK. It's going to be different for you in a library context than for somebody who's in a university or a school or um, a business. So every organization's context is different. and. One way of thinking about this, using painting as a metaphor, is that everybody has different brushes and palettes and is trying to achieve something different. So my point is that you can't just take a framework off the shelf and expect it to work. Because what you're doing is you're taking someone else who's created that for reasons of power. Let's not beat around the bush. They've created that framework for a particular reason of power. They have hard coded that they don't tell you what is behind the scenes, the decisions they make, and then you're taking that off the shelf and expecting it just to work. And I have never seen anybody take a digital literacy framework just off the shelf without any contextualization and it ever worked. The second thing I want to talk about is digital literacies being plural. So if you search your favorite web search engine, whatever that might be, Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing, whatever, you will come up with hundreds, thousands of definitions of digital literacy. There's as many definitions of digital literacy as there are researchers in the field. But something which really helped me was when I looked at what Alan Martin said in 2006 when he was coming up with a, a European framework for digital literacy. And he said, digital literacy is a condition. It's not a threshold. And that really helped me because I think up until then, I and other people were thinking about digital literacy as being a threshold to get beyond and then you're digitally literate as opposed to being a condition, a way of being. As an example, imagine that you pass some kind of Microsoft Office test in 2002 and now 15 years later in 2017 you think that because you passed that Microsoft Office test in 2002 that you are now still digitally literate forevermore. That would seem a bit ridiculous. So what I realized was that there isn't really one definition of digital literacy to, to rule them all and in the darkness bind them. No, instead, what we're talking about is a plurality of digital literacies. So digital literacies are highly context dependent. It really does depend on the sector you're working in and the country in which you're operating, etc. You can't really just take a worldwide digital literacy and expect everybody to um, achieve that or it to be relevant to what people are doing in their particular context. Another thing to say is that digital literacies are socially negotiated. And what I mean by this is that instead of taking a definition of digital literacy off the shelf 
and applying it to your context. You need to think about what that means in your context. And the best way of doing that is by negotiating it with the people that are going to be affected by whatever it is, whatever program you're bringing in. So I want to give you a way in which you might be able to approach that. One thing that I found in my thesis was that there is no one wonderful framework for digital literacy. So instead, what I came up with was this meta analysis of lots of different digital literacy frameworks and, and research in that particular field. And I noticed that there were certain essential elements of digital literacies that seem to be important. Now, I don't go into lots of detail in terms of how you define these, but let me just run through them quickly. So you've got the cultural, creative, constructive, communicative, confident, cognitive, critical, and civic elements of digital literacies. And a guy called Ted Parker, who is Mr. Ted P on Twitter, he framed this, uh, after I'd published my work, he framed this in terms of four skill sets and four mindsets. And what he did with that was he just broke it down into the skills that you need and then the mindsets that you need to be able to develop digital literacies. Now, if you want to do that, if you want to develop digital literacies in your particular context, then think about those skill sets and mindsets, but also think about how you can talk about them with your colleagues. What does it mean to be critical in your particular context? What does it mean to be digitally creative in your context? Come up with those yourselves, negotiate them. Don't just take it off the shelf and expect it to apply in your context. And then when you're thinking about developing digital literacies, put them together, mash them together, think about if they were chemical elements, if you combine them, what would happen? and then come up with activities and programs as a result of that. Okay, so how do you go about developing people's digital literacies? How, in your particular context, do you take these essential elements of digital literacies, um, make sure that you've socially negotiated what they mean in your particular context, etc.? Well, I think the first thing to think about is, although this isn't a perfect diagram and it could be a lot more three-dimensional, one way is to conceptualize the difference between skills, competencies, and literacies as skills being very discrete things that you can teach people in workshops, competencies being kind of bundles of skills, and literacies being people reflecting on their own skills. So for example, Helen Beetham and Rona Sharp back in 2009 came up with this really nice pyramid of how you how people think about their digital competence, uh, their digital literacies, etc. So we need to go beyond access, which I think a lot of us do now. We, we haven't got that as much of a digital divide, maybe in the same way that we had before. We've got these skills that we develop, certainly in libraries and other places where people say that they can do things now. They can access this stuff. They can, you know, message their um, grandson. They can um, fill in their tax return online, whatever it is. They, they can do that thing. And then we move beyond that as kind of a collection of these um, digital skills to instead be thinking about their practices. These are the things that I do. On a, on a regular basis, I do these things. Um, it's not just a one-off thing. It's not just something in, in one particular example. It's a bundle of skills. These are the things that they do. But then the thing that I think we need to aim towards is changing people's digital identity. So saying that they they are something, they're capable of doing something, and this is just who they are, this is part of who I am at the end of the day. And I think if we get to that, that's when we're being successful with digital literacies. So what I've been talking about with these digital literacies, they exist on a spectrum, and they exist on a spectrum in two ways. They exist on this spectrum between the procedural and the critical, and what I mean by that is procedural things are click here, press there, do this, press this button, this happens, etc. And we need those kinds of skills, obviously, to be able to use uh, user interfaces. But the, at the other end of that spectrum are, is, is a critical element, the critical end, should I say, of digital literacies. And this is reflecting on, on whatever service you're using or the best way of doing something. It's saying, is Instagram the best way of getting my message out here? It's saying things like, um, should I be sharing this using this particular Creative Commons license? Um, all those things, like reflecting on your own practice. It's the opposite end of the spectrum to merely pointing and clicking. And then the second way that literacies exist on a spectrum is between the social and the individual. So 
you know, being able to do things for yourself and by yourself is important, but then there's also the kinds of literacies that are involved when we're part of a community or a group or a network online. There's certain things that we need to take into account when we're doing things in that particular arena too. So if you put these two kind of spectrums together, you end up with this kind of nice grid. And if you think about these as being quadrants, then you can imagine developing digital literacies in all four of these quadrants. And as an example, then maybe let's take Wikipedia. So that might go, editing Wikipedia might go in the social and the critical part of this particular construct in the, in the top right hand quadrant. And let's think about, well, if you were using Wikipedia to develop digital literacies in that area, what would that look like? Well, here's an example. Let's say that you are contributing to an article on Wikipedia. Uh, well, what, what digital literacies does that involve? Well, I would say that you're being constructive, you're trying to build something. Um, you are involved, getting involved in something which is outside of yourself, not just for your own benefit. So this is a, a civically minded project. And also there's an element of, of criticality here as well. It's making sure that you're putting the best information in and you're representing things from a, a hopefully neutral viewpoint, etc. So contributing to an article on Wikipedia is a way in which you can develop digital literacies in the kind of social and critical quadrant uh, of that particular diagram that I showed before. So part four, libraries. What do you need to focus on when it comes to digital literacies? Well, I'd suggest that all of them are important and you should be thinking about how you can be taking off and thinking about how you can be combining all of these different elements of digital literacies in new and interesting ways. If you think there's something missing here, by the way, um, please do let me know. If this doesn't cover all of the different things that you think should be covered with digital literacies, I'd love to kind of revisit this and have a look at it. But for the moment, um, I think something which people questioned when I first came up with this was the, the civic element. And the civic element is a really key element, just like the rest of them. It's, it's fully as important as the rest of the elements of digital literacies. And I think especially over the last 18 months to two years, we've really seen why that's important. And here's just some of the things that came to mind when I thought about the civic element of digital literacies in 2017. I'm thinking about fake news. I'm thinking about um, kind of digital government and how we can engage um, as, as kind of democratic citizens how we can avoid election fraud by know what's going on behind the scenes how we can avoid spam how we can think about how smart cities are going to be both fantastic and also problematic from a privacy and security point of view so all of these things i think libraries have a, a really important role to carve out a space for this kind of discourse, this kind of engagement, um, and this kind of development of digital literacies when it comes to wider civic society. Okay then, so in conclusion, let's go back to this diagram here, this framework. Is this any good? Well, hopefully now, when you've been listening to what I've got to say about digital literacy frameworks, about the plurality of digital literacies, and about being able to do view source on things and seeing what's behind them so that you know whether it's relevant to your context, you can come to a decision. It's not up to me to say whether this is a, a good or a bad framework. I just hopefully have given you a slightly different approach to think about this. So I would suggest you do these three things and good things should happen. Number one, understand literacies as being plural and about power. So you should approach off-the-shelf frameworks with extreme caution. Number two, you should talk to one another about your context, your organization, your sector, uh, what it means globally at the moment about digital literacies. And then thirdly, in your particular sector, in libraries, think about how your organization can help develop the civic element of digital literacies. Because now, more than ever, we really need libraries to play an important part in developing this particular element of digital literacies. So thank you very much for listening. As promised, here are my contact details. You can get in touch with me via Twitter, via Mastodon, and also via email. I've put my email address there at the bottom, hello at dynamicskillset.com. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your feedback, and please do ask me any questions that have resulted from this presentation. Goodbye.